Okay, so now we're going to talk more explicitly about relative motion and how to do some of these calculations. Now again, you're usually not going to be told in whatever situation that you're trying to calculate explicitly that you should be using reference frames and relative motion. So when might you need to worry about relative velocity? Well, if you have multiple objects that are traveling with respect to one another, and obviously we've talked about planes, cars, and spaceships, trains are another one, that if you have one passing another or a person in one of these and a person on the ground, you might need to do that. The other situation where this comes in is when you're traveling with respect to a medium, for instance, air or water, that is moving itself. So if you're swimming in a river, even if you think you're sitting still with respect to the water, you're going to end up downstream. That's something you intuitively know. So this is where uh, we talk a lot about these ideas of different reference frames. There's the reference frame of the water, and then there's the reference frame of the shore. Another example is flying in wind, that if you just toss a ball up into the air when there's a really strong wind, it's going to blow over to the side, because at that point, it's actually moving uh, not with respect to the wind, right? Like it's still with respect to the air, but the air itself is moving. And similarly, if there's current, for instance, just the ocean tide, boats in the currents just like swimming in a river. So in this case, the water, the air is what we call a medium that you would be traveling through. And those are the situations we really need to use this. So now I want to get a little bit into the math, and this is where the notation is going to come in. And this situation I'm going to work through somewhat explicitly. It is the same one in the book, if you are looking at the book. And we actually have three people here. We have Amy, Bill, and Carlos. Bill is in the car, Carlos is on a bicycle, and Amy is standing on the ground. So Amy is defining our reference frame. So this is one thing to notice, is that whenever we're defining reference frames, we're usually defining the reference frame with respect to an object, or in this case, a person. So Amy is our reference frame. And the reason we say that is that Amy is not moving. So when we define a reference frame, we want to talk about something that is still, something that is stationary with respect to that reference frame. So Amy is our reference frame. Carlos and Bill then are moving in Amy's reference frame, but we could talk about the relative velocity between Carlos and Bill. Notice that there are two subscripts here. The order matters. So when we say CA, this is Carlos with respect to Amy. WRT is a common abbreviation for with respect to. So this is the velocity, and in this case we're talking about one dimension, so this is our, our x direction. So only worried about one dimension right now, Carlos, with respect to Amy, is traveling at 5 meters per second, right? And that's in the positive direction. Now, this other one, AB, is Amy with respect to Bill. Now, the answer is not here 15 meters per second, because that's how fast Bill is going with respect to Amy. So think about being Bill. What would Amy look like from Bill's point of view? it would actually look like Amy's going backwards at 15 meters per second. So this here is actually negative 15 meters per second. So what is this one? This one is then Carlos with respect to Bill. And what the book's annotation of this is pointing out is that for this to work, you're effectively canceling these inner uh, subscripts, right? I have an A on the right here, an A on the left there, so it's like these A's are canceling and I'm left with a C on the left, a B on the right. Now this works as long as you always get the order correct to mean this. So we're left with the velocity vector that represents Carlos with respect to Bill. Now if I just look at this picture, right, it looks like Carlos Carlos with respect to Bill, let's see, so Bill is moving to the right at 15, Carlos is moving to the right at 5, so if Bill was to look backwards at Carlos, it would look like Carlos is moving to the left at negative 10 
meters per second. But now let's come over here and look at the math. So if I just try to do the math, I could say that this is, let's see, my first one we said was plus 5 meters per second, and my second one was negative 15 meters per second. The math then also says negative 10 meters per second. So the math works out, and so does just the reasoning. So the notation here is really important. We have two subscripts, and there's a recipe you can follow if you get the order of the subscripts right. So it's first object with respect to the second object, and when we define the reference frame, the reference frame is where that second object was sitting still. And in this case, we have three objects, so we potentially have three reference frames, but if you note, we never put the C on the right, so in this situation, we either thought about the reference frame of Bill or the reference frame of Amy. In this calculation, we never considered the reference frame of Carlos, but of course we could have. Now there are two things that are going to be true if we use this notation. One is that if you flip the two uh, indices, the two subscripts, you get a minus sign. So the velocity of Amy and Bill's frame is minus the velocity of Bill and Amy's frame. So that's just like saying that if I think I'm standing still and someone's walking away from me at one meter per second, if they were to look back at me, they would say I'm moving in the opposite direction, that minus sign, at one meter per second. So that's what that says. Now, notice here I'm jumping from talking about one coordinate, the x component, to making it a velocity vector. So this is where we're moving to, actually thinking about entire vectors and not just components. If you talk about an object in its own reference frame, i.e. Amy with respect to Amy, that should be zero. So be careful in that whenever we're talking about an object's reference frame or something moving with respect to an object, an object can't move with respect to itself. So that's really what we're doing when we're defining zero. Okay, so now to just generalize a little bit, we now are going to have two-dimensional vectors. Now this picture might be a little bit confusing, but we again have three objects. Notice that we're defining a reference frame with respect to A, so A stays at the origin of that reference frame. Now A could be moving with respect to B, but this reference frame keeps moving with A, However, remember, it can only be a reference frame if it's moving in a constant velocity. So A must be moving in a straight line at a constant speed. So A and B are moving with respect to one another, and C is some third object. We could define a reference frame with respect to C, but we don't have to. So this is just like how we never asked about Carlos's reference frame, but we use both Amy's reference frame and Bill's reference frame. We can define a vector that uh, is the displacement between the two of them, or the position of one with, with respect to the other, and that could be changing in time, but then we can also define these other vectors. Now remember that we said before that if you switch the order of the indices, you get a minus sign, and we also said that just negative vector is the flipped vector. So C with respect to B is the vector from B to C, but B with respect to C is from C to B, and these are just negative vectors from one another. So notice, and this is now just generalizing from what we had before, that now instead of only dealing with one component, we're dealing with the entire vector. These internal indices are again the same, our first index stays on the beginning, and our last index stays on the end. So just as what we had before. But now the point is, is that we are literally doing vector addition. So what does that look like? So in this case, we would want c to a plus a to b. Now, of course, you can switch those around if you wanted, right? You can do vector addition in whatever order you want. And so notice that this vector addition problem is equivalent to this plus that. And so CB is your answer then, because we can say that vector CA plus vector AB 
which is the easiest way to write it, to remember your indices, your subscripts. That's the same thing as just flipping the order, which is what we most clearly see in this diagram over here. So remember it this way, because that's how the equation is easy to remember, but it's okay if you flip those around. So now, let's look at this picture here, which is a real-world example of when you would actually want to use this. The plane is flying through the air, but the air is moving, i.e. we have a wind. And in this case, we have a wind that is perpendicular to how the plane is flying. So now, if I want to use this equation, I can say that the speed of, or sorry, the velocity vector of the plane with respect to the air plus the air with respect to the ground, and again, notice I have these internal uh, subscripts, which are the same. This is going to equal the velocity of the plane with respect to the ground. So now in this case, the plane with respect to the air is this vector, the air with respect to the ground is that vector, and when we add them, you get this hypotenuse vector. So that's how the plane is actually going to move with respect to the ground. So this is a really common thing to think through. Again, you might be in a situation where of these three, one of the vectors on the right side you don't know, but then you just need to use a vector subtraction to figure it out. One more question to bring it back to the conceptual side and see if this is making sense. We now have Yoda on an asteroid where these two rockets are coming in, one from below and one from the right. Now in this case, we've labeled their velocity vectors, again, not considering a plus or minus sign, since this is now a two-dimensional problem and not a one-dimensional problem. So if we were, this is what the question is, if we were to have Yoda, instead of being on the asteroid, be on rocket one, what speed would he see rocket two traveling at in that case? And there's a few options here, so go ahead, read through those, Think about this to check yourself to see if you understand how to do this in two dimensions. Okay, so hopefully you have a decision. And the answer is actually something else. That remember that when we're adding vectors in two dimensions, we would need to add them component-wise, and you're actually going to get in this case a hypotenuse situation. What my super awesome picture down here shows you is that Yoda's now on this rocket. We don't even need to worry about the asteroid now. And the rocket on the right is not only now traveling to the left, but is also traveling downwards with respect to Yoda. And so you get a hypotenuse, and you would only be able to then figure out the speed by doing the square root of the sums of the magnitudes of these two vectors. So that would give you the new speed. So to briefly summarize, the important thing about inertial reference frames is that everyone agrees on the laws of physics, such as acceleration forces. But we might not agree on what the velocities of a given object are. That's okay. When we're doing math to denote objects in different reference frames, you're going to use two subscripts, and this allows you to work with relative velocities, but make sure that you use this common notation where the first letter is denoting the object that that velocity is referring to, and the second denotes in which reference frame it is. So again, A, B would be Amy with respect to Bill. Finally, remember to use the rules of vector addition and subtraction when working with two-dimensional velocity vectors and these relative motion situations.